been one of our center meetings. We usually hold them on the Friday night, starting at 8. But because of the uh, timetable of everyone in our team as well, we'd like to thought we could try to move it forward to the Wednesday and 7 o'clock to accommodate everyone. For those who are, who are here and don't know who the speaker is, sorry about that, but you picked the winner of the night. Um, the speaker is Parker Alton Mark, uh, uh, an astronomer of great note, and also been around for a long, long time. I understand he was born in 1927, and uh, got his degree in the, the mid-50s or so, and then worked at the Mount, Pal Mount Wilson Palomar Observatories, now the, the then later called the Hale Telescope on Palomar Mountain. And in the mid-80s, he went to the Max Planck Institute in Munich, where he's been ever since. For those of you who are stimulated by his talk, there's a couple of books out. The one that uh, is in our library, Ottawa Public Library, is the older version of the book, Quasar's Redshifts and Controversies. And the new book that's out is Progress in New Cosmology Beyond the Big Bang. So I encourage you to look into these titles when you uh, leave this meeting. The speaker is Dr. Hart. He's going to be talking. He gave a talk earlier today, so uh, he's probably, I don't know if he's going to redo old jokes or just uh, improve on old ones. I'm not sure. But I'm sure if I'm talking to him over at dinner, he sounds like it's going to be a very interesting presentation. And I invite you to all join and help and let us welcome him to Ottawa. Australia. 
And uh, I was there cataloging peculiar galaxies, and I was sort of the expert in peculiar galaxies. And one day, uh, somebody came to me and said, look, here's this uh, galaxy we discovered on the Smith Survey place, and it looks as though it has these tight little objects coming out of it. Well, I was the typical expert, you know, I know all about these things, so I looked at it and said, no, it's a flight defect. It's nothing. Uh, well, of course, it turned out to be the most famous and uh, the best example of a real jet galaxy. And later on, I was able to get uh, photographs at the, uh, at the CTI telescope in Chile. As a matter of fact, I had a whole uh, uh, test run, and I spent a lot of it observing this galaxy and I got very deep photographs. So the first slide will show you why this is such an unusual galaxy. <coughs> Can we have the first slide, please? <coughs> it, uh, on the original place, these, uh, these uh, things are very, uh, um, okay, I'm just these uh, are quite faint, but this is a superposition of many galaxies, and uh, there's been star removal uh, performed on this. this is a, very nice image processing technique where you remove all the fake stars and all the just the bright stars are left. But uh, and it, it's to emphasize these jets that come out. This is a famous uh, long leg jet that comes out and then suddenly makes a right angle. And people have asked me why that jet makes a right angle, and I have to tell you I don't know. That's a big, big uh, unknown. Uh, however, if this strong jet comes out in this way and this direction here, and then I think you can see this faint counter jet. See, there's always tends to be a jet and a counter jet. Uh, uh, I'll show you this uh, same galaxy in color now. Uh, and this was done again by the same imaging process as at JPL, a jet propulsion laboratory in, in Pasadena. Uh, and you can see it in color. Uh, okay. And you notice, and this becomes very important in what I'm going to say, that the jets on this side are strong and blue, and on this side they're weak and red. And uh, this is going to be uh, quite important. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is a uh, focus a little bit. This is a color picture of the interior to show you what an active galaxy is. Uh, there's hot spots in here. It's called a hot spot nucleus galaxy. It's a large spiral. And these beautiful spiral arms coming out. And then, as you can see, the faint jet goes up in through there, and it's actually broken through the arm here. And you can see the arm is sort of fractured. And then there's a missing point in the, uh, in the uh, arms on the opposite side, which really shows that something physically has gone off from the nucleus of this active galaxy, with a lot of energy in the, in the nucleus, and gone out on either side in a kind of an ejection. Um, now, this was all very nice about galaxies and uh, these mysterious jets and so forth, but the breakthrough really came when the first X-ray telescope went up which was called the Einstein Laboratory, with the, and, and it produced some rudimentary X-ray results, which I think are next, uh, shown on the next slide. <laughs> and uh, here's the X-ray results. You see these little isotopes indicate where the X-rays are coming from. Well, there's a lot coming from the galaxy itself, right in the middle, and then there's these little spots around there. They, they, they're numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, and uh, when somebody actually they bootlegged this observation to me, they came to me and said, we found these, uh, these spots and they may be uh, uh, something significant. What do you think? And I, so I went to the telescope and, and identified them optically. And they turned out to be faint blue stars. And then I was going to Chile at the time. This is a southern hemisphere ob object. So I got the red shifts of these things and they turned out to be quasars. And that was very exciting, because to find six quasars so close together and so close to an active galaxy, it was, well, the chance of this happening by accident is just negligible. 
problems. So you can just tell by looking at this picture and knowing that these are parties are, you know that they have to be physically associated with these axis galaxies. Okay, uh, now, just as I say, now this new gross X ray telescope is going up, and I have observations, uh, these new observations, and I have one uh, transparency which I can show you, uh, which I just recently had made up. And here it is. You see, I've outlined these jets in white, and then these colored spots are all the new X ray observations. You can see they're much better resolution and much crisper, and we know a lot more about it. I must say straight off that this object is normally the brightest quasar in the group, but for some extraordinary reason, just at the, at the time of this X ray observation, this thing had, had dropped by a factor of 30 in intensity. These quasars are so variable, uh, their intensity fluctuates up and down so much that this particular object was almost dropped out of sight on this particular observation. I'll show you some others where it's, where it's up in its normal range, which makes one of the brightest quasars in the group. So now we have this amazing situation where we have this active galaxy shooting out these, these optical uh, jets, and we have these strong X ray sources, bang, 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 and these bright ones are essentially all uh, confirmed as, as confirmed uh, quasars. Ratio is about 5 tenths to 1 uh, in, that, in that range. But you see there's, there's something a little strange here in the sense that these quasars are all on one side. Uh, now the question is why are they all on one side in this galaxy? Now uh, I should just back up just a minute and say that over this field, for several years, I went down to Las Campanas in Chile and measured quasars all up to a degree. And it's only about 11 arc minutes in here. I measured a huge area in here, measured all the quasars in there. And I came up with 31 quasars. Uh, so that there's a, a concentration of about 31 quasars in this direction of the sky, and most of them must belong to the galaxy. Uh, so, that, and, and in this region here, the density of quasars is 20 times the, the normal density of any region of the sky. And frankly, if I were, as a professional astronomer, if I were another professional astronomer, and looked at this, and I saw this concentration of quasars, I would have to say, well, that, that's it. These quasars really belong to the galaxy, and we have to re-examine uh, our, our, our notions of, of what makes redshift, what causes the redshift, because these are certainly not expanding away. Uh, with, these, with these philosophies, but in this new uh, in these new X-ray observations, uh, I, I just started to investigate this question of uh, what causes the uh, bright quasars to be all on one side, and this is one of the latest uh, plots that I got out from the computer, and you can see the following thing. And that is that here are the bright quasars, the bright X-ray sources, I'm sorry. And of course this one is, is temporarily absent, so there's one, two, three, four, seven of them up here. And there are uh, fainter X-ray sources down on this side. Uh, there's eight of them here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But they're much fainter, and they're also much harder. And by much harder, I mean this that they're higher energy, the, the spectrum is more concentrated than the higher energy. And uh, so immediately, it, uh, it gives you the idea that what might be happening here is that there is some absorption, some, uh, in this case, would be hydrogen absorption, which is in a plane from the galaxy, which is obscuring uh, this, the quasars on this side and not on this side. And uh, what this would be like is if the galaxy was pointed at you like this, and on the top you saw them uh, unobscured by the plane, and underneath they were obscured by the plane. Now, this looks like, a, I think, a reasonable interpretation. I think this is the one that's going to have to uh, be the correct one because uh, not only are these sources dangerous if they're being absorbed, but the nature of the absorption is such that the X-rays are absorbed by hydrogen, which would be in the plane of the galaxy. Uh, and 
the soft x-rays would be absorbed more than the hard. So these would be harder. And now I have a, a, a plot which I'm going to show you, in which you can see that as they get absorbed, they get, uh, as they get harder. Uh, now, does that make sense? And can I go back to this uh, observation again? And you can see that if the if the galaxy is pointed, uh, pointed this way towards you, that you're seeing up in here, unobscured by this disk, which comes out, and down here it's obscured because you see it's reddened and absorbed. So uh, that has two consequences. First of all, it means that the disk of hydrogen goes outside the optical disk. And this is known from, from spiral galaxies. You see the optical disk and the rotating curves in the interior. Exterior to that, there is a, a hydrogen disk, not marked by star. But it's unusual that it would extend so far out because it has to extend out this, and that would be very unusual. So uh, the, the, the job now is to get hydrogen measures with this, probably from Australia, and to, to check on, on that. But the other thing, which is so interesting now, is that. Uh, it means that if these bright ones are quasars, that these probably are quasars also. I mean, what else would they be? They're point sources, they're X-ray sources, and uh, if they could be optically identified, they're quite faint, they would undoubtedly turn out to be quasars. So what we're presented with is a very active galaxy which has uh, a group, a bunch of quasars just a cloud of, of quasars. And, and this would be the most uh, most uh, uh, populous uh, galaxy with quasars. It would be a, a sort of a, a, a final a proof of this uh, of this association of quasars with galaxies. Now, uh, I also have the survey, X-ray survey observations, which are over a larger area. And you can see this is the, the galaxy that I'm talking about. And these are three of the quasars. Now you see this quasar is very high. It's in the it's normal state. And going down in this other direction, we have more X-ray sources, including a quasar a candidate here. So over the large portion of the sky, apparently these quasars are aligned, they're concentrated toward the center, they're absorbed by the, by the hydrogen and, and, and uh, dust and gas in the, in the galaxy. <coughs> and this is uh, uh, probably the best example of association of quasars and galaxies. Now, there's one thing that I, I do want to say, which is a little technical, but I think it's, it's very exciting. And it is, I had high resolution x-ray observations of it. And you can see that now this quasar is very bright. It's a normal state. The other bright one over here is now off the field, because this is a smaller area of the field. You see there's a region in here which is filled in with some Apparently, X-ray material, which goes up and toward these these stars, but um, the uh, the PSPC, the uh, the uh, broadband observations, just didn't show anything in there, and so I suspected something that there might be an ultraviolet leak in the X-ray filter. So I just before I left, I looked at the hardest X-ray, and there's nothing in here. Uh, but in the lower channels, in this particular observation, there's lots and lots of stuff. And you see, here are the two quasars. They're apparently connected by material which now looks as though it's ultraviolet radiation between 1500 and 1700 angstrom. And what this means needs to be investigated because it might be redshift and not an alpha. It might be uh, uh, some sort of hot gas. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it, it, it's very interesting physically to see what it is, and uh, it's very interesting physically to see what it is, and of course it's further confirmation of the association of these, uh, of these uh, quasars. Well, uh, if the quasars are associated with the galaxies, then comes this question of uh, what, what is the redshift to? Go a little bit into the theory at the end, but 
the point I want to make now is that we know something about this redshift, this non-velocity redshift, from looking at the nearest galaxies to us. And that means our local group and the next nearest group out, M81. And I want to show you some of the, the latest results on this because it bears directly on the question of what is this excess or this intrinsic redshift due to. And the next slide shows, uh, sort of introduces the subject. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, that's a, a picture of MA1 in, in true color in the sense that uh, you see the mass of old stars in the center here, uh, and then you see the bright young blue stars in the, in the spiral arms. This is an SD spiral galaxy. The SDs, I will find, are the, are the uh, uh, the central galaxy, the dominant galaxy, the parent galaxy in groups of galaxies. And the other galaxies in a group are uh, younger and smaller. They're called companion galaxies. The next slide shows it. it's an example of this, which is <coughs> M33 in our own local group. And this maybe looks something like our own galaxy, which is a companion to M31, the central dominant galaxy in our own group. And you'll see that the old star uh, uh, central portion is much reduced, and the young star uh, portion is much accentuated. So the one thing you can say for sure is that these companion galaxies, these uh, these these kinds of spirals, have a higher percentage of younger stars, and and we can make technical arguments about whether that means they're younger or not, but certainly they have higher uh, percentage of younger stars. Now, uh, so. What about the uh, the redshift properties of these galaxies we know the most about? And these are not quasars; they're not exotic objects. They're they're really the, our nearest neighbor galaxies. And here's a plot which shows uh, what we're dealing with. And this is our local group. M31 is the central dominant galaxy, and these other galaxies should be orbiting around it. And you see 20532. Our Milky Way system, this is us, the small Magellanic Cloud, the large Magellanic Cloud, and so forth. And now this is a new system which has just been, uh, well, not discovered, but it's been known for a long time, and it was not known to be a member of the local group until they got a, a good, or measure the rending and observation part of it, they could correct it, find the distance, they found the fact it was a member of the local group. The amazing thing is that every one of these local group companions have a higher redshift than the central galaxy. Now, if these if these galaxies were uh, in orbit around the central galaxy, you should see as many coming towards you as going away from you. If these, if these were velocities, you should see as many plus velocities as minus velocities. And in fact, you don't. You see the fall plus, and this new one has plus 289 kilometers per second. Now, Okay, this is our local group. What can we say about the next nearest group to us? It's the M81 group. That's the Whirlpool Nebula, the one with the first color slide I showed. And here's M81, and here are the companions to M81, including M82, now, which is a very explosive galaxy just to the north of M81, which is actually linked to M81 by a hydrogen bridge. So we know that's in the group, we know it's part of it. And yet it's got an excess redshift of almost 300 kilometers per second. So all these companion galaxies also have excess redshift. And the chances of this happening by accident is one uh, uh, is, is uh, this is 22 galaxies all here. And the chance of these 22 galaxies all having plus redshifts, when the chance of being any one of them is only 50 50, is about one chance is four million. So I think that there's only one chance in four million of, of, these, uh, of this being an accident. So we have to take it very seriously. And the question is, what is, does this tell us anything about what causes the excess redshift? And this excess redshift, I would claim, is the same excess redshift that's operating in the quasar. Well, you look at these galaxies and you say this is made up of stars and dust and gas. These are made up of stars and dust and gas. These, they're all galaxies made up of stars and dust and gas, like this. What is the one difference between 
these dominance galaxies and the companions, and you have to say it's the amount of old stars. These have the biggest amount of old stars, and you can see in the spectrum of these have younger stars. Uh, I would say, in fact, that they're younger galaxies. This immediately uh, uh, translates, correlates to the um, to the uh, to the quasars because they also have to be young. And the way they have to be young is you, you realize that these are point energy sources of tremendous energy. They're radiating very hard. The pressure, the radiation pressure inside is tending to blow them apart. The energy can't last this long. They're burning energy at too great a rate. So therefore, they have to be young for those arguments. These don't have to be young from that argument. They're just young from the, from the fact that they're close enough by to the study of the individual stars in them. As a matter of fact, uh, if you study individual stars in them, uh, you can see that uh, the individual stars have uh, have excess redshifts too.
professional journal called Astronomy and Astrophysics, the European Astronomy Journal. And my eye was caught by an article. This is just a random event. And because my name was in the in the title, it said something about ARC 105. And so I looked at the article to see what it was, and I recognized the galaxy right away because it was called ARC 105 because it was in the Atlas of the Cuban Galaxies. And uh, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I started realizing what the article was saying, and I realized that this article was direct confirmation of this result, which I was just showing you about the excess redshift of companion galaxies. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of this object, which is called our photo And uh, this is not my picture. This is a picture in the, in the article. And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting little history about this, this object. Actually, you see, in the 1950s, when the Sky Survey was done at Palomar, and people were able to look, out, look at, at a complete photographic record of the whole sky, there was an Armenian astronomer called Amritsumian, Victor Amritsumian, and uh, nobody had very much heard of Victor Amritsumian. He was kind of a hero in, in Armenia, uh, but uh, the astronomical world hadn't heard of much of him. And he had access to no telescopes, but he just had a copy of this new photographic atlas that had come out from the Palomar Observatory. And he studied it. He really looked at, at those galaxies on the, in that atlas, and he thought about what he saw. And one of the galaxies he saw was this galaxy. And uh, I have a black and white photograph of it, but and he saw it in black and white. But he saw this E galaxy here, and he saw it <coughs> ejecting this galaxy here, the straight filament, and this tremendous ejection filament coming out and in that galaxy, and there's some more stuff coming off here. And these and other galaxies like it led him to uh, the conclusion that galaxies ejected new galaxies, that this is the way new galaxies were born. And Amartya Sen announced this in 1957 at the Solvay Conference in, in Belgium, and again in 1960, I think, in, uh, in, the, in the IAU meeting in, in California. And people at that point paid some attention to it. Uh, independently, I had been making this atmosphere galaxies with much better photographs with the 200 inch and this was number 105 of my atlas and I didn't know about Amersumion's work at the time and I also concluded that this galaxy was ejecting and that this was uh, this is the way the galaxies were born. So uh, the, the two of us agreed on this and we published this. Now that's uh, 1957. Uh, this is 1994, 37 years later. This paper appears in Astronomy and Astrophysics, and they don't mention anything about ejection. They say, well, this is an example of collision and merger, because collision and merger is a, is a great uh, fad uh, these days. And whenever anybody sees two galaxies anywhere near each other, they say, ah, they're, they're merging, or they're colliding with each other. And they forget all this evidence about the radio ejection coming out and so forth. So that, uh, in fact, I even saw in one paper the following remark. If you see two galaxies next to each other, they're in the process of merging. If you only see one galaxy, it means it's already merged. Uh, <laughs> this is the uh, kind of approach that we have here. So uh, I was uh, sort of amused by this interpretation, uh, a little provoked by it. Uh, and, and, and felt that, in fact, we've gone backwards in these 37 years. But that isn't the electrifying thing about this, about this uh, system. What is really electrifying is that this person who published this paper had measured the redshifts of these companion galaxies. Uh, this one, and 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 this one, <laughs> all together, they measured about a dozen uh, galaxies measured last. And the nine galaxies that were in the redshift range of this, all nine companions are higher redshift than this central galaxy. And now you see here, 
there was no argument about which was the dumbest galaxy. Everybody said this was a massive elliptical. And they said it was central in the cluster. So that and that these were the companion galaxies. And here were the companion galaxies, uh, all nine of them here coming out close redshift. And this is a, a confirmation at a level of about uh, about four times ten to the minus three, uh, chance of being accidental, four chances in a thousand of being accidental. Or if you took the ninth galaxy, which was also a little higher redshifted, um, one chance in, uh, in uh, two chances in a thousand. Here I'll show you the plot. <coughs> and you see it looks just like these plots that we were looking at for the uh, for the local group and the M81 group and the Virgo cluster for that matter. And here's the dominant galaxy, and here the kind of all of our direction. Well, um, what does it mean? It means that some uh, agency, some mechanism that's working in these companion galaxies, which is not philosophy, but which gives a direction. And empirically, I would argue that that's Age. The younger the galaxy is, the higher the rich. <clears throat> and there is um, there is some suggestion as to why this might be so, uh, which I may go into in the, in the last few minutes. But I want to show you now from the slide another example of ejection and why I think that Matsumiyama was right when he said, galaxy, do we have this slide, please? Uh, why, uh, why galaxies <coughs> were born from uh, other galaxies. Now this, this was originally uh, uh, classified as a quasar. It's a radio source called 3C120, and on the low resolution plates, they look just like a star, so compact. These are very high resolution plates that I got at uh, Palomar and Kitik, I think, and superposed and put into true color. So you can see it's a very active uh, galaxy with jets coming out this way, and that very peculiar galaxy up in there. <coughs> so it, it's, a, it's a very young galaxy. It's got a very young spectrum. The stars in there are young. It's extremely active. It's a radio source. And uh, the next slide shows what uh, the radio shows. Here, is the central blue object that you just saw, and here are these jets coming out, and you can see the radio jet here, much further out, and these big radio loads on either side, and this galaxy, companion galaxy up here, at plus 5,000 kilometers per second, which is very, very peculiar, and which must also belong. Now, this is like the X ray sources that I was showing you earlier today, and uh, maybe I'll just show one or two now to emphasize the similarity. Here are, here's another uh, active galaxy quasar up there. Here's the active galaxy with the quasar, this one you just saw. And here's the strings of, of, of X ray sources. Apparently, I would say being ejected, that's a quasar. A lot of these in here are quasar candidates. I think we must be seeing the same phenomenon. And this phenomenon you see in all scales in the universe. You see it uh, in, in, in our towering stars, power over very big objects, stars just forming in their own galaxy, ejecting things in opposite directions. 
can see it in galaxies on all scales, you can see it in the X-rays, and it always involves this, uh, this uh, different kinds of uh, redshifts. And the only unicorn principle I can see is that they are that they are younger material, material which is created at the center of the galaxies and, and, and shot out. Now, uh, I showed the, the Virgo cluster earlier today, and uh, maybe I want to you know, refresh that. This was, uh, well, that was not published. Uh, it was presented in the in the IAU, but it shows the Virgo cluster in X-rays. And this is, as I said, the center of our local supercluster. Center of our local supercluster. And you can see the connection all the way down from the active galaxies in the center of the Virgo cluster down to this this called famous place on 373, which is again a connection of a young high ratio object into uh, a group of Older objects, and uh, I show now uh, some of the most highest energy observations ever made in the new uh, uh, gamma ray observatory. And now these are gamma rays, which are you see the X rays have energies from uh, tenth of a keV up to uh, two two keV. These gamma rays I'll show you now have energies up to uh, from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 MeVs, huge energies. And this is the area which I just showed you at the bottom of the, of the Virgo cluster. This is uh, 3C279. And it was not announced in, the, in this Sky Telescope picture. But right here is 3C273. So apparently, the Virgo cluster is extended downward in very, very high energy radiation. And you can, you can see here now this this gamma radiation which is indicated by the by the big isotopes here. The reason the isotopes are so big because the gamma ray telescope has low resolution. And so it, uh, it only can resolve about this much. But the important point is that as you go down the Virgo cluster, you have the optical radiation, you have the X radiation it's becoming higher and higher energy, and finally you get down into the gamma radiation, which is extremely high energy. And the question is now, where does this high energy radiation come from? <clears throat> and uh, I would guess that the only possibility would be matter creation. Uh, and I think that this, even more than the question of the redshift, is the, is the real frontier exciting uh, area in, in, in astronomy now. Uh, if you don't have the Big Bang, and I think that these observations certainly rule out the Big Bang, then you have to say uh, you have continuous episodic creation. You don't create everything out of nothing 15 billion years ago as in the Big Bang. You're creating material all along. And, uh, the question is, what would be the signature of that? How would you know if that material is being created? How would you know if you, if you could see matter being created? And the answer is, I think, that you would see this uh, this new matter annihilating itself, say, new uh, uh, positrons and electrons annihilating, giving gamma rays, or maybe the breakup of particles, giving pions, which give a gamma rays, these huge energy things. And it's very short lived. And this would be the observational signature of new matter, and that you would be seeing in this case uh, the creation of new matter, as you see in these galaxies here. Now, <clears throat> the only thing I want to, to say now to uh, to uh, include this to the sort of tie it together is that. You have to ask yourself the question uh, of in what form is this new matter being created? Are you going 
going to, uh, and first of all, I should explain the word creation. Because the universe is defined as everything that we can see or, or could see, you're not going to create new universes or create new matter that wasn't already in the universe. You would have to, say, uh, recycle it or it would be materialized from a more diffuse state. And if you were looking at a, a point in space time and suddenly new matter came up, you would say, well, okay. It materialized from some other place in the universe. So you might, might call it an emergence of new matter. And uh, the question is whether this new matter arrived with the, uh, the masses, the protons, and the neutrons, and the same masses that we know all the time in our terrestrial laboratories. And uh, as I explained earlier today, there is a, a solution of the general optimistic equations, which uh, Non-current, I consider more, more general. We should say that this matter arrives in a zero mass state. In other words, the electrons that are newly created, the protons that are newly created, are created with a very low mass, and as time goes on, they grow. Now, if that's true, then you can get your annihilation radiation. You can get this tremendous uh, radiation that we're just observing now, <clears throat> and at the same time. You would have the high redshift, which are the signature of the new matter, the young matter, uh, the quasar, uh, and, and the young galaxies. So this would be, I mean, I'm suggesting this as a, as a, as a, as a time together of all the observations that you see here. Uh, this next slide I just will show you the, 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 the final sort of uh, empirical de Gras on this, you see this active galaxy 3C120 is surrounded by quasars, these uh, black dots the quasars. This has been published for a number of years, but, but ignored. Uh, there's, it's another uh, indication that, in fact, these high rates of quasars are associated with this recently created uh, material from this galaxy. So this would be a, a, a suggestion on how the thing might work. And as you know, <coughs> the theories are never proven. It's just the theory you can disprove. And the only way you make progress is disproving theory. And <coughs> I think that what we've done here, or what we can do here with these observations, if, if you judge them that way, that we disprove the Big Bang, we disprove instantaneous creation, uh, and we now are dealing with creation ongoing creation of matter in the universe, and, uh, and whether or not uh, this can be used to explain the redshift phenomenon, uh, that remains to be seen. But I think it would be real progress to say that we have, that this data does disprove the Big Bang, and that we're left with this uh, fascinating new evidence on the emergence of new matter into the universe, which is going to grow into our galaxies, into galaxies like our own, and give rise to the, to the life that we know. So I guess I would uh, stop there and invite questions. Thank you. Matter with its present mass, and then we can't explain the redshift. 
produce the new matter below mass, then we can explain the redshift. So that's the uh, thing that we're discussing. <laughs> I don't quite understand this point about the redshift from the low mass because I, I would have thought that if you create your electron from low mass, you in fact produce a blue shift. Uh, it, it does the following way. Uh, when the electron makes a jump in its orbit to emit the photon, because the energy of that photon which it emits is a function of the mass of the electron. So if the mass of the electron is low, then the energy is low, and the photon is redshifted. And then as time, and if, as time goes on, the mass of the electron grows, the energy of that transition is higher, and it becomes blue-shifted. So it starts out very redshifted. As time goes on, it becomes more and more blue-shifted. Mm -hmm. Over what period of time does the slow mass electron assume normal, quotes, normal mass? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, because <coughs> the, the, the actual solution of the Einstein equations, which Jonathan made, uh, has the mass during is t squared. The mass during is times squared. Uh, and, and if you, uh, Put in for the time the age of the, the old star in our galaxy, so that's the only parameter we put in. You get out of it the exact Hubble relationship. You get an exact Hubble relationship. And in fact, you get H naught equals 50. And what that means is that uh, the, uh, this electron is considering is exchanging gravitons with the rest of the universe, but the universe that it sees is getting bigger and bigger. And so it's exchanging gravitons with more and more in the universe. And so its mass is growing. Its mass is growing just the right amount so that as you look at more and more distant galaxies, you're seeing them earlier in their lifetime when their mass of electrons were lower and their redshifts were higher. So what it means is in a non-expanding universe, in a static universe of indefinite size, indefinite age, you get an exact well, uh, redshift distance. Except for the for the objects which are younger, which are born younger, and then they have a, a high Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't this scenario describing blur uh, all special line measurements made in the laboratory and earth? I mean, just the slight dispersion in ages of the atoms being used at any one time should cause um, should make it impossible with extremely sharp lines that we actually see in the lab. Well, no, the point is that any if, if the galaxy say is born at a certain epoch. All of the atoms in there will have the same masses and so forth, and you get all the same dimensions and so forth. If something is born a little bit later, i.e. it's younger, then its line will have the same width as it says the chemistry, but then we shift it to the red. So you're saying the galaxy is born essentially instantly. It can't be born over a period of many, many years because then the lines um, would be broadened within the matter of that galaxy. No, I, I don't think the galaxies are born instantly. I think there is a spread in the edge of the galaxies, and I think that's what explains the fact that the supergiant stars in the Magellanic clouds are systematically redshifted. And the picture I think I would recommend is that you have a cloud of, of pre-stellar material, which is going to form into a star. Okay, that cloud, the material in that cloud was born at a certain time, forms into a star, star of a certain epoch has a certain redshift. There's another cloud which is born later, which is younger. It forms into a star. It has its, its spectrum and so forth. But because its epoch is younger, the lines are redshift. But supposedly our solar system is made up of both the primordial matter, but also that from supernova explosions, excuse me, the elements. Um, these presumably would have a spread of time, a spread of ages. Well, the, 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 uh, there's something that's a little difficult to keep, to keep straight here. Uh, and that is that there's an evolutionary time. I mean, see, the, the star is born, it, it, it goes through its evolutionary cycle, it goes into the white dwarf stage, it maybe explodes into a supernova. That's all evolutionary age, but the matter which, come, which constitutes that is all the same epoch, it's all the same age. And I think that's true of most of our galaxy and certainly of our local neighborhood. But, uh, a star that's born out of uh, younger matter goes through that whole evolutionary cycle, but but 
its matter is, is consistently uh, uh, redshifted. You see, in the in the magnetic cloud, for example, if you have uh, matter born at one epoch and another, uh, the older epoch, which would be the, uh, the bluer redshift, that goes through its evolutionary cycle, and those those supergiants burn away, leaving only the most recent uh, the matter most recently created. And they have a high redshift, and that's why the supergiants in the Magellanic Cloud have a high redshift. It's, 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 the, it's the point of creation of the matter. Yeah, it's not the evolution. Yeah. So as this matter acquires more mass or gets heavier, its gravitational field is going to get stronger. Is that correct? Yes. So what, when it's first brought into existence through this mechanism, what fraction of what we consider to be normal mass would have what percent, two percent, uh, half? Well, I think in, in the very beginning, it starts off from zero, essentially. I'm wondering how you can have a star form if it might not have sufficient gravity to stay together as a star. Oh, if the mass not yeah, it's not going to form at that. It's not going to form until it gets enough uh, gravity to start to pull it together on, on the conventional way when stars form. Yeah, no, no. It, 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 it will acquire mass rather rapidly at first, and then go into the normal normal phase. Uh, I might just make another comment, and that is that it's always been a holy quest to unify or to understand the connection between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. And if you go through this m equals zero phase, then you're at the natural transition point between quantum and, and, and classical mechanics. So I think that's an interesting uh, opportunity for physics now. That, that's a little off your point. Yeah. Would you not see some tendency that the further our quasar is away from its parent galaxy, the less redshift? It seems to me to see an evolutionary trend going away from the parent galaxy. Yeah, and, and Narc has actually worked out a model for that uh, where where the quasar is, is ejected and goes out and, and, and it ages and, and, and acquires certain riches. But uh, I don't think we know enough about the distribution of the redshifts of quasars around these galaxies to say whether that's, that's true or not. And also the fact that it depends a lot on how forcefully the particular quasar has been ejected, whether it's been ejected to a large distance short distance. Uh, I, I can't say that the, the quasars of redshift 1 appear to be the most luminous, and the quasars of redshift 2 and 3 are, on, on these observations, very low luminosity. Now, I, didn't, I didn't say this, but in, in, in this uh, NGC galaxy, NGC 1097, there is a very faint quasar there in redshift 3, and that's what you about to expect. Because the luminosity is low, the mass is low, the luminosity is low, the redshift is high. Uh, it, no, you might find something that's uh, eventually, but I don't think we have enough data. Presumably, the, the decrease then in, in luminosity after you said decrease to one would be uh, in the star formation? Or, I know you talk about the luminosity increasing to one and then dropping. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's a function. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, probably the increase in luminosity as it ages, say from redshift three to redshift one, is is due to the fact that the mass is growing and there's more of an energetic reaction, and then it begins to start to form and disperse, and then it uh, doesn't drop very much. I think it levels off. <clears throat> yeah, what is that? Yes, there was a similarity uh, mentioned earlier about uh, black holes and kind of the positive the black hole as the event horizon. I've uh, generally heard that uh, we uh, treat it in terms of space falling in faster than speed of light rather than matter falling in faster than speed of light. And I'm wondering, when we say that matter is being generated on quasars, are we, uh, is this synonymous to generating space as well? Generating what? The space, like the. 
I'm a total amateur when it comes to that. But uh, let me just uh, try to uh, rephrase again. Past event horizon of the black hole. What I've heard is space falls towards the black hole. And that's permitted. Matter cannot fall. Transcendence be applied towards black hole. So if a black hole drags space and matter into itself, would the matter generated by a quasar be equivalent to the reverse process basically generating space as well, like, like in the inflation, uh, inflationary model of the universe where we... Uh, yes, yes, I think that's a very good step. First of all, oil point out that a white hole is just a time reversal of a black hole. Observationally, I would say that all the evidence shows things flowing out, not flowing in. So I don't see any observational evidence for a black hole, and I believe Marmay's arguments, and I think that the black holes are, are not realized. Uh, so observationally, empirically, I see the outflow. It is a time reversal, and uh, I think it is black in the inflationary universe. And, and the point, that's a very good point, because the inflationary aspect of the Big Bang was raised in order to save the Big Bang from some contradictions, from the internal contradictions. But the, what they didn't realize at the time when they introduced this inflationary uh, model was that that was just the old C term, Hoyle's C term for creation of matter. So that, that, was, that was what Hoyle introduced for the steady state theory, actually, to, to uh, inject matter into the, into the universe. And I think it is, it, it is the reverse. I think often uh, scientists start out by getting things backwards. <laughs> they start out, I don't know, I hope they finish up. Yes, do you have some comments about uh, the recent uh, Virgo cluster uh, observations? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's been much in the news now. And they, They've gotten a, a determination of the uh, Virgo cluster distance at 15 megaparsecs. And um, and this is a point of much contention. Well, I'm going to have to dis describe this. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to describe this. Um, okay. There's been this uh, contest between the people who say the Hubble's the constant expansion is 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and those who say it's near 100. <clears throat> and what they've done is they say the crucial thing is the distance to the Virgo cluster. And they take the, the redshift, the mean redshift for the Virgo cluster at about 1,000 kilometers per second, and they say, well, if the distance to the Virgo cluster is about 21 megaparsecs, which is what Sanders uses, then the, then the Hubble constant is 50. And if the distance to the Virgo cluster is about 15 megaparsecs, then the Hubble constant is around 87. Now, the trouble is, of course, all right, so there's been a big uh, battle. Recently, with Space Telescope, they have measured septiums and two spirals in the Virgo cluster, and they get both of them, they agree on 87, or very close to 87, with a small error. So, okay, the people uh, with the high bubble constant say, wow, we won, that's great. But they're in big trouble because if the Hubble constant is 87, then the age of the universe is uh, only one half the age of the oldest stars, which is a paradox. I mean, how can you have the stars older than the universe? Uh, now, the only way they can get out of that is to, is to put in a cosmological constant, which is what Einstein called the, cos the, fudge, the fudge factor. He, he abandoned it, he doesn't like it. Uh, but it's a, really what it is, it's an adjustable parameter, which is now put in 
Road of Hunter have about 800 kilometers per second redshift. The spirals have a mean of 1,000 kilometers per second. But the a, SAs and the SBs is practically none in the Road of Hunter. The galaxies we can really trust, the galaxies like the center of our, 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 our local group, they have redshifts that are either zero or negative, I mean catastrophic. So what it amounts to, and you can show this on a plot, you can choose any redshift you like for the, for the Roto cluster. So okay, the distance is 15 megaparsecs, but uh, H0 equals 50, I believe, because that's the inverse of the, of the solution we get for the static universe. Uh, and that just tells you something about the age, the mean age of the Roto cluster. So, as I, as I said, I guess the third time, if, if, if I talk to Sandy and I say, Alan, I don't care what other people say, I believe H0 equals 50, but I don't believe the universe is expanding. You see, it depends on what redshift you take for the, for the Virgo cluster. And that's the part that they will overlook. Everybody just said, oh, we know the Virgo, the Virgo cluster is a thousand points per second. And they haven't really looked at that point. That's a crucial point. It's the redshift that come in. Always the redshifts that are causing trouble, and they're causing trouble because people make easy assumptions about it. <laughs> uh, let me see, back for it. Yeah. You, uh, you made a comment before about the black holes that was sort of a little throwaway comment about not seeing much of it. I'm not sure you can understand that. Well, all I'm saying is that all these this photographic evidence, all this observational evidence, all the spectroscopic evidence I see. Is evidence of material outflow. Black holes would expect material inflow. And I'm just saying that I, I only see evidence for, for, for white holes, out stuff going out. That's an empirical observation. Yes, you've uh, shown us some good examples of uh, active galaxies with the quasar showing the shifts in the um, showing this, but mm -hmm. I wonder if it has there been a um, more extensive survey, a uh, biased one, of all active galaxies or uh, a random sampling of active galaxies and looking at the quasars around them. What kind of results come out of that kind of survey, if there has been one? Well, there's two systematic surveys that have been done. One systematic survey that I did that took something like three or four years, which was to look at a, a, a pre selected sample of companion galaxies. And there I found that the quasars were uh, more uh, dense near the quasar, near these companion galaxies, by a factor of 20. It was a 16 sigma signal. So I consider that a very strong statistical proof. The establishment don't disagree with that very much. Uh, the other thing is, you say about active galaxies. Well, there's been no systematic survey of active galaxies, but I can tell you the following. That is, we know what the most active galaxies are. I've shown you a lot of them. And every one of those most active galaxies you would look at has lots of quasars in them. I guess I'm asking, are there any counter examples for what you've shown? You mean an active galaxy without quasars? Or active galaxies with quasars not showing the redshift anomaly that you're describing? Well, you know, see, the quasars will always have high redshift compared to the active galaxies because the active galaxy has to be close enough for you to see it pretty well, so it's going to have a low redshift. Uh, so if you see quasars around a uh, low redshift galaxy, you know, active galaxy, you got it. Uh, but I don't know a single active galaxy that doesn't have, have these things in its environment. I mean, like this one I showed in the colored picture. Uh, I mean, and, and, and you see, the, the people who reported this, these redshifts didn't mention the fact that all these companions were higher redshift. And they knew, I mean, they must have known that this was a Absolutely crucial point in the whole debate, you see, and they didn't even mention it. I, I can imagine they didn't mention Albert Sumion, or I can imagine me, or the ejection, or okay, they can talk about collision and merger if they want. This point about the about the systematic redshift, that, that really should have been should have been mentioned. Yep. Oh yeah, back here is a new one. Yeah. Okay, I'll when you create matter, don't you make a lot of order? Make a lot of order, like, you know. Make order? Yeah. When you create a few centuries. Well, interesting, yeah, that's, that's a nice question. Uh, you have to, you're, you're creating uh, a zero entropy, a lot of information. And and that's a, uh, an argument I had with Roger Penrose, actually. He's, he 
he argues that uh, that the uh, in order to create a universe, you have to have so much information uh, that you uh, you can only do it once, or some some argument like that. But I think what what you're getting at, I think, is a very important point, which is that you're creating this matter with zero mass, but it has lots and lots of information. It has enough information to make a whole galaxy, because I think it, it, it evolves into a whole galaxy. And so you're not going to, you can't create an isolated electron or positron. You have to create an ensemble of these things. And that's why I think you only create in the presence of big masses, because then you influence a region of space which is large enough to introduce a, a diffuse pieces from some uh, diffuse mass energy from another place in a large enough quantity to have enough information in it to produce a quasar which then evolves into a galaxy. If, if that's what you mean. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. If uh, if things tend to go towards randomness, like should the yeah. cycle of creation run so kind of you're saying if things tend to go towards chaos to yeah. randomness, shouldn't this cycle of creation of matter just burn out? Oh, well, yeah, after you create a galaxy, it's going to run down, yeah. run down the thermodynamic hill. But as, if you're asking about in a region of space, uh, will the creation run down? Uh, I would think so, probably. If all the creation seems to be episodic. Now, whether our local supercluster is going to continue to fill up and get more and more dense, or whether it's going to quit, or it's going to take up a place, take far off, take up in another place. That's the presence of the future. I mean, that's, yeah, that's you, always, you always have less energy than you serve, so eventually. Uh, probably not on a universal scale, if you if you believe in the conservation of mass energy. Then you say if mass energy pops up here, it's subtracted from someplace else. <laughs> but eventually you run out of your ability to do useful work. It's all kind of waste. Yeah, unless you can recycle it. But of course, don't forget that this non-expanded universe that I'm talking about is of indefinite large extent. I mean, the, the point is we may, in, in all our uh, in all our pride and arrogance, think we're seeing a lot of the universe, but in fact, it may be just an infinitesimal part of, of the universe that exists. So the cycle can't perpetuate itself for the creation. It, it depends on whether it recycles, uh, whether it's reversible, or whether it recycles, and how much of a reservoir it's drawing on, how big the universe is. But can you recycle 100%? What? Can you recycle 100% of the energy you have? I don't know. I don't know. Again, we have time, I suppose you can do anything. You see, there's no time limit on this either. But is it reasonable that you could? Huh? Is it reasonable that you could recycle all the energy? Yeah, given enough time, sure. I don't think that the uh, proton is going to last forever. I mean, they talk about proton decay. Uh, is there a high probability? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other thing you have to realize is that I don't think you should necessarily assume that everything is always got to be the way it is now. Uh, and and it, we may be going through changes which we can hardly uh, imagine. But why should a lot of physics out there where the equations are be different from what they are in the Oh, that, you should ask the question the other way. Why should the laws of physics out there be the same as they are in our time in the world? Yeah. Here's uh, the cosmic background radiation pack, and if it is not a signature of the day pack, what might it be where this could get in your view of things? Okay. Uh, on the Big Bang, I think the concept of background radiation is very, very difficult uh, to explain because you have to say that it comes from the last surface that you see out, or the first surface, the decoupling surface. And at that surface, you have to have a smoothness to the front part and 10 to the fifth, and you should see the footprints of the galaxies, the primordial galaxies, and you don't. And so there's all sorts of gyrations about cold matter and, and uh, biased cold matter and so forth and so on. And I think it's just very, very difficult. On a, on a non-expanding universe, it's just as 
simple as it can be because you're just seeing the temperature of the intergalactic medium. Um, in the Blue Cluster, is there an equivalently large display on the opposite end of it? Like, and one time we were seeing is kind of a bilateral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, um, no, there isn't. Uh, not, well, no, I shouldn't say that. The Blue Cluster does continue on up the north. The x rays seem to be petering out here. But this is what I consider to be the center of the Blue Cluster, M41. This is the oldest galaxy. Uh, it's the brightest galaxy in the Blue Cluster. And it's the lowest redshift of the big ellipticals. So I think that's the center in 40 million. And, and this is almost symmetrical. Now, what this uh, higher energy extension is, I don't know. It may be pointing somewhat toward us, or uh, it may be a recent event. It may be uh, counterbalanced on the other side by later. Um, in most of the um, diagrams you, you show us, there was, there turned to be a Larger ejection one way than the other. Mm -hmm. Were those all in any way aligned? As if could it be like representative of a circle or anything like that? Mm. No, um, I don't know what you mean by a circle, but. Uh, well, if you don't, uh, if, 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 if it's a spiral in two directions, are these at all aligned that spiral? Or are they just pointing around and eject at a time direction, like it's a larger end? Pointing any which way. Well, I think for every ejection there's a counter. I mean, that seems to be an empirical yeah. principle. Um, but but as for the for the direction of the ejection and the counter ejection, uh, I don't know. That seems to be a mystery to me because uh, if you take this for example, uh, and you say okay, say this is an ejection and a counter ejection along the minor axis, which is what you would expect. Then what is this ejection? Well, the main axis, that doesn't make any sense. And you see this pattern again and again. You see it uh, to some extent in NGC 1097, uh, and you see it in the other four X-ray uh, observations that I show them. They seem to be uh, in this direction, and it almost made me think that maybe ejection isn't the total story. Maybe, for example, it's intersecting strings, white, white lines, and where they intersect, you have a creation and maybe then that generates the the, uh, the pressure in there and the ejections that are forced down along the strings. It's just just a suggestion. I mean, just to indicate that maybe we don't have to go do everything with ejection. Maybe even ejection isn't the primary primary thing. <laughs> yes, but this dark matter but this not be newly born matter. If you're talking about the, the, this great amount of this dark matter, could this not be this nascent matter? Well, you have to understand uh, how this dark matter came about. My viewpoint on the dark matter is that, for instance, uh, in a cluster of galaxies, they measured the redshifts, and they assumed the redshifts were velocities. And to have this much velocity, they had to have a lot more matter in that cluster than they saw in luminous galaxies. So that's where the dark matter came from. But if a lot of the redshifts in that cluster are not velocities, then the need for the dark matter disappears. So I think that the, the, for me, the dark matter was just something that was invented to explain the discrepancy in the standard picture. And you know, they've looked for it high and low, uh, whips, the uh, nachos, uh, under the bed, and behind the closet. They haven't found it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they spent a lot of money. Yes. What scale, go back to the problem of the mass varying, um, it seems to me that if you have very low mass nucleons, you will have no nuclei. Yes. Well, it's, it's relative, you know. I mean, it's, it's always a. a uh, all the mass uh, varies in ratio. Uh, I it think it doesn't scale up the equations like it does for uh, atoms. Uh, at, at a certain point, I do believe you're going to lose normal chemistry. Uh, I think more of the, 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 the nuclear predictions, yeah, the nuclei in the 
see in your ejected quasars mm -hmm. a, a very different nuclear ratio than you see in normal The atomic nuclear? Yes. Uh, would you mean it, would it does it matter we have a different chemical composition? Yes. I hadn't thought about that. There is a problem with the quasars from the standard standpoint of view, and that is a lot of these high register quasars now, they have determined a very metal rich. And the problem from the standard uh, theory is that they don't have time to, to get that enriched. So there's, uh, so I do know that. Uh, now I hadn't thought about how the uh, low mass uh, would predict. I don't think so because according to Paul, uh, the nucleosynthesis, uh, well, but he doesn't use low mass, that's right. Well, you brought the upstate. You brought the unsafe. With all that. Uh, okay, okay. All right. Uh, would it be bad to have to do that on the same? It's very, it's then presumably very difficult to synthesize that in heavier. If you uh, have no A equals 2. Yeah, that may be so. Oh, and then the question is, at what point does the synthesis take place in the, in the mass scale? And now I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's something to look into. I, I, I will try to remember and ask my my mass uh, my nuclear synthesis experts. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me as a that uh, sort of universe off with a big bang. Philosophically, it's kind of stupid. I mean, I can't imagine you know starting a, a universe with a bang. I mean, it just uh, it seems kind of bizarre. Um, philosophically, I'm just wondering um, why this particular theory of the creation of the universe is so tenacious. Why why do why do people and say with with you, when you get observations that are discordant or when you have to go through all kinds of gyrations to defend it. Um, why, why is this theory so attractive to most astronomers? Why do they want, not really want to think about anything else or another option? Yeah, it is rather difficult to uh, work on a farm for a while. You, know, you have to ask the question, you have a cosmic egg, uh, where was the cosmic chicken that laid the cosmic egg? Uh, and how, do you, how do you produce something out of nothing? Uh, well, I guess there's two answers. First of all, inertia. I mean, if people are taught something and believe something, they find it hard to change. I find it hard to true of myself. And secondly, I think that, they, that the, the, the conventional people will tell you, well, there's just nothing better around. I've had one of the best physicists in the world say, okay, there's nothing wrong with the whole monarch theory, but we don't need it because our present theory explains everything. But of course, it doesn't explain these observations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, operation happens is they say, well, okay, there's no better theory to replace it. But then if you start suggesting an uh, alternative theory, you say, oh, no, that's crazy. That's, 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 that's unworkable. <coughs> For one reason, because we haven't heard of it before. And so it sort of has of built-in stability. Is that, is that caused by the fact that a lot of these researchers have tended to much work on the line? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. But, I mean, everybody has to make the choice, you know, if, if you're a researcher and you make a certain assumption, and you go ahead and base your life work on that assumption, um, well, then you sort of have to take the consequences if it's not right. So it's not necessarily science, then, it's uh, people. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Art for coming out this evening. He's, uh, he's in Ottawa to talk at uh, the University of Ottawa, and he's extended his stay to uh, come and pre present us a very interesting talk He still 